Well, Sam, I'm playing a little bit slow. So if you ever got any smart aleck, smart aleck comments you want to make to me, I probably can't respond very witty right now. So you, you want to take advantage of my weakened state, go ahead. But I do appreciate you coming on. Um, my eyes and ears out there today. So I appreciate it. So that's, that's what you are for me today. <laughs> the next witty comment you make will be the first one. There, see, I can't even respond to that. So you can just, <laughs> you can, it's free for all right now. Um, but I am, I'm curious because obviously I wasn't able to be out there and you've had a chance now to watch them a couple of different practices in general. For, well, before I get to that too, I do, we are going to talk about Sam's article on RFK stadium and the site and all that, why it's a long shot, but I, I will start with football. So in general, what have you seen from this team from what you've watched over the last couple of weeks? What's jumped out to you? Yeah, anyone who is watching this on video will be able to tell uh, by my sunburn uh, yeah. that, that I have been out there watching them uh, the last two days. I will say Ron Rivera holding practice at 8 a.m., especially when it when it's going to get up to, uh, you know, the 90s, the mid-90s in Ashburn is, is a good call. Um, on the field, I mean, there are a couple obvious things that stand out, which I'm sure we've talked about, is, is the Carson Wentz arm strength. It just looks different, you know, coming out of his hand than it does out of Alex Smith or Taylor Heineke or – any of the six or seven guys we've seen play starter here. Uh, Jahan Dotson's hands, I really do think stand out. They especially stood out today. Um, you know, with Terry out, Carson has, in the two practices I've seen, thrown to him quite a bit. Uh, they've used him on some screens. Uh, so I think that he's going to be an, an active member uh, of that receiving core. Uh, I think one of the other things that stands out to me that's notable is that they haven't, almost exclusively, I have not seen them take a rep in 11-on-11 11 11 or 9-on-9. Nine three linebackers um so really they've, they've been focused exclusively on Holcomb and Davis in the, in the first set and uh, Mayo and Hudson in the second set obviously Ron said they'd like to add a veteran there they still haven't um those I think have been the main takeaways for me other than you know certain lineup combinations or you know they had Benjamin St. Juice playing slot today right. which we did not see him uh play in play uh inside much during his rookie year if at all uh and he said that was really because they, they thought that Kendall Fuller's vision um, is really what allows him to play well outside. Uh, you know, Ron said he plays with, with vision like Josh Norman played with vision, which obviously made him a very successful corner in Carolina in a similar style of defense. So that's my rambling, you know, here's what, here's what we've seen so far. Well, I do want to stick because I wanted to ask you about the secondary too, because a lot gets paid attention to on the offense, right? But defense with the, with the secondary, I am curious of that because and I agree with like Fuller plays is a very smart player, good vision. It's why he's really good in zone. And I thought he struggled early last year because they played a lot more man because they had William Jackson. I felt like Fuller got better as the season went on because they played a lot more zone, which is more to his strength. How did, but again, you still, you need somebody to play inside. So how did, how is St. Juice looked inside there? I know it's very, very early, but how has he looked there? It, it looked today like when he was trailing, you know, whether it was Jahan or Curtis Samuel in the slot, he looked like, you know, he looked fluid. He looked all right. Um, you know, I, there were, you know, a couple completions that I wouldn't read too much into. But to me, um, he just looked comfortable getting set there, um, which is important. I, I will also say that I think that, you know, Jack Del Rio might do a little bit more experimenting than we anticipate right now. Bobby McCain, who we talked to safety with corner skill set that he's played a little bit of slot um this year uh especially as they try to figure out what that defense looks like post landing collins if they don't end up bringing him back um then i i think you're going to see you know they like the flexibility they had with that three safety set i i think right. you know you're going to see more of that cam curl has obviously done that so to me uh that you know that's an uh that's an option certainly moving forward and so anybody watching now, you see people lingering outside Sam's <laughs> window there. If you get jumped, just let me know and I'll call 911 for you. Um, Thank you. But with, with, with that safety set then, because then it's also, I've heard, I've heard good things about Cam Curl and how well he's looked early on. And then also Percy Butler's got a factor in there. What has he been doing and how have they been kind of, can you tell what they're doing a lot with the Buffalo nickel um, position? Yeah, we asked Bobby also about the Buffalo nickel position because Ron obviously has mentioned Percy Butler, the fourth round pick out of Louisiana, as being a guy that could replace Landon Collins. Um, Bobby was really impressed by his smarts. First of all, he said he you know, doesn't make the same mistake twice, which 
I'm a little skeptical of. I'm a little skeptical that that Percy Butler could step in and, and play with the smarts of Landon Collins right mm-hmm. away. It's a lot to ask. Um, it's a lot to ask of any guy. Um, but, you know, Bobby certainly had rave reviews for him. I think that, uh, you know, when we talk about that Buffalo nickel spot, um, it's something you could see filled by committee. I could see Bobby dropping down and playing some slot corner as well. Uh, so I think it's going to be really interesting how they – approach that because as Jack Del Rio said he thought a reason the defense struggled in the first six weeks last year was because they didn't have continuity in the secondary this year they certainly do right and what do you do you what do you think about the depth there both in the entire secondary not just core but the depth overall in, in the secondary I, I think they could have stood to add like linebacker another piece or two um, mm-hmm. I think you know you can never have enough corners and, and when you look at that um, room you see you know, two two standouts, two depth veterans, and and an unproven second year guy in, in Benjamin St. Juice. Um, obviously, you look at the safeties, and, and maybe Derek Forrest steps into a bigger role with with the Shazer Everett departing. Um, but to me, I still think you could have used some depth there. And I still think they probably need to add depth there, because I, I I'm I'd be a li- I'm a little bit concerned with what they have at corner, because we don't know like you have to see if Benjamin St. Juice can play that slot. Now, Danny Johnson did a nice job there, but I think they're a little bit thin there. Unless a guy like, you know, Christian Holmes can kind can kind of show something. Have, have you seen Jamin Davis moving differently? And again, it's sometimes, it's really just to let people know, it's, it is hard to tell sometimes how guys are really doing, especially at very, like, I think linebacker can be tough because you have to know what they're supposed to, where they're supposed to fill. And a lot of times it's easier to get that after you go back and you're watching the game, you can get, see the gaps where they're not filling, but you can see how a guy is moving though. So can you tell a difference at all in Jamin with how he's moving? Have you been able to focus much on him? I, I have looked at him and, and there are plays where it looks like he gets the hole, but to be honest, uh, I don't have a great sense of how much progress he's made. And I think that, you know, I'm always a little hesitant, especially at that position, because last year, I mean, they weren't gushing about the guy, but Ron Rivera and Jack Del Rio and his teammates were praising Jamin for how well right. he was coming along, how much he was picking up. And then obviously we see he's ultimately not interested to, to ever really play middle linebacker during the season. So, um, you know, couching it appropriately, and, and to be straight up, I haven't been able to notice a, a huge difference. And, th- and that's fair. And like I said, I think that's a position that's very difficult to tell from our vantage point in camp because, you know, while these coaches go back and watch every play again over and over and over, we get one shot at it. So if you're not like, and what, you know, what and we've talked about this, like I just try to watch a guy on this play. I'm going to watch this guy because I want to learn about this guy. And sometimes on that play, nothing happens and it's on the other side. If you try to see everything, sometimes you see nothing. So you almost have to focus on those guys. And it's hard to do. It's, it's, it's a, have you gotten used to that at practice? <laughs> yeah, I, it, it is, um, I think, a skill. And, and when you say, like, watching football practice is a skill, I think people would roll their eyes or, you know, be a little skeptical of you. But it, it certainly is um, – I've learned that that is something you got to – you got to pick up quick because obviously coming from baseball, you know, where the access is, is, you know, so much more and you're playing every day and there's just a lot more data, uh, a lot more, you know, ways that you can quantify, Hey, this is what this guy is doing. Well, and this was, this is what this guy isn't doing well coming to the NFL where you have such limited opportunities, not only to watch them practice, but uh, also to see them in games. And, and this, the data set is so small. Um, it, it has forced me to, to kind of approach it differently and say, okay, you know, at this practice, other than, you know, oh, how's this guy doing with the injury? Right. How's he moving? It's, hey, I want to see, you know, I need to watch every Carson deep throw. I really need right. to, like, focus on this part of his game or, um, you know, Wes Schweitzer's at center. Let me check out how his feet are moving, things like that. It's, it's definitely force, It definitely forces you to focus in also because there's so many more moving parts. Right. And there are times, I think we talked about this last year during camp, like, I'm trying to watch a particular receiver. And on that play, every time I watched him, he did nothing. And then the fourth play where I would, would watch someone else, that guy would do something. And it was just, but it's like, that's how you, you can't, it's hard to pick up. Again, if I'm just going to watch the entire thing, you're going to see what happened, but you may not always get a great read on what you want to see. You know, I like to see matchups. I like to see, you know, I like the one-on-one matchups, whether it's off O-line, D-line, which we don't get till camp, um, things like that. But, you know, in these settings, 
you're really watching to see how our guys moving. And especially that turns us back to the offense, because what you really get to see is how are, how is the offense looking? Does it look like it's in rhythm? Does it look like it's moving well? So for you, how has it looked? One, one more point, actually going back to that, not to, not to disrupt the flow, but to me, this is sort of a, an argument for, uh, you know, working things hand in glove. Like when I see something in practice, if I notice something, you know, I then ask a coach or ask a player, Hey, this is what I saw. You know, what do you think about right. that? And, and to me, it's the same discussion about analytics and film. Like, you know, obviously you can glean things from just looking at one source, but when you really look and, and kind of verify through both sources, that to me is, is a much stronger case to be made for, right. for seeing something. So, you know, I'm always a little hesitant for, um, people who can look at just one area of, of evidence and say, you know, this is what's happening. Right, uh, it's right. really an argument in football, especially uh, to say that everything is contextual. You know, you all, you know, things have to be working in concert. Um, uh, anyway. Uh, well, and, but, on, along, but along those lines, it's what I always tell people. The best thing that we have is access. So like, I like to watch the games again so I can then ask people in the building, Hey, this is what I saw. You know, this is what I'm seeing. And or this, this, I saw this on this play. Can is did I see it right or what happened? You know because but it's the same thing. So like you, the our ability to have access is what should is what really is the is the best thing when you take when you take what you see and you then can apply. Because there have been a lot of times, Sam, like over the years, you know, I'd I'd see something on film or I'm watching the game and I'd ask a coach. I said, you know, is this what is this this is how I'm interpreting this or why is this better? And they'll say, yeah, but, and they'll take you one step further. And that's when you really learn the game. And that's when we can then educate people who are listening. Absolutely. And, and I don't want to bore people by talking about like the mechanics of, of journalism. But one thing that, that uh, I was taught in college that, that I really do subscribe to is strong articles, strong arguments, strong conclusions really applies to anything. You want to see three different types of evidence. You want to see statistical, you know, numbers illustrating, hey, this is what happened. You want to see test, you want to hear testimonial, the people who are involved, the experts saying, yeah, this is what's happening or no, this is what's happening, not, not happening. And anecdotal. Uh, so, you know, being able to show that it happens, to show that this, this you know, trend of numbers is, is, is actually, you know, playing out in, in this example and this is the people talking about it. So statistical, testimonial, anecdotal, those to me, if you have all those three, that's a really strong argument. Along those, along those lines, I remember way back when, 10 years ago, did a story on Robert Griffin's rookie year, and I was, remember talking to Mike Shannon after the year, and I said, I noticed that his numbers went up in the red zone. Did, is that because he just, was he learned the game more about whatever? And he said, so what it really wasn't about that as much. He said what it was is teams stopped playing them a lot of man coverage as they went on. So it simplified their coverage schemes, and, and it simplified their – um, the, the, the coverage for them. So they knew what they were getting. So they could then run stuff accordingly and had more success. So it's a, they took away something from the defense, but you see that because you went and looked at the stats and, you know, then you could go apply, you know, take what you see or learn and then ask somebody to say, okay, this is why they're having more success, but it's, it was the impact of Griffin, but it wasn't because the offense was somehow reading it differently. It was just because the defense had to simplify what they wanted to do. Absolutely. And, and uh, I, I think that like, that, that's probably important, not just in football, not just in reporting, but, you know, looking at those three things and being able to contextualize that for people is, is probably helpful anywhere. But anyways, let's get back to right now. That, that's a good <laughs> discussion. I know we both enjoy that. But um, with the offense, um, have you seen like have you seen a good rhythm so far? And I've heard that Carson's looked pretty good. Um, have you seen a rhythm with this offense? Have you seen it? Is this something where you say, "Hey, this offense could be pretty good," or do you say, "I need to, obviously there's a lot long way to go"? But you know, what, what are you what are you taking away so far? Yeah, I think the early signs. Uh, you know, every running back is getting. Uh, getting reps with the ones uh, Carson is it seems like he's building a pretty good rapport with Jahan Dotson we I think we've talked a little bit uh, about Curtis Samuel and how he does look like he's trusting his speed more trusting his groin more obviously he said last year the speed's always been with him but he's just been hesitant to really let it loose and he went down to Bomarito uh, in Florida where a lot of NFL players train before the combine in the offseason and he said the Bomarito pushed him hard enough that um, his his you know his inhibitions 
uh, kind of went away. So I think you have seen him get a little bit crisper. Uh, I think Carson throwing um, ha- has been noticeably, you know, pretty good in rhythm. He can throw it deep, as we talked about. And one of the things that stuck out to me today isn't necessarily the, the 40-yard, you know, bomb that they would put on Twitter in a clip, but Carson was, was checking it down today. He was throwing some screens. Mm-hmm. He, was, he was, you know, rolling out and taking the, the, the guy in the flat. And I asked Scott Turner, I said, hey, you know, Carson's past offensive coordinators have talked about the difficulty of getting a guy like Carson who likes to hunt the big play to check it down, to stay alive. At this stage of his career, is that something you can change? Or do you just say, hey, you know, you got to accept who that guy is. You try to maximize it and, and try not to, you know, put him in possibly big negative plays. And Scott said, look, I mean, like at some point, you know, he, he talked around it a little bit and he said, you always want to play to the strengths of a guy. But at, at some point to me, is he leans closer on the this guy at the stage of his career is who he is, and, and so you're going to have to work around that. That that's what I heard, um, you know, I guess, or what I interpreted from from his statement. So that was an interesting point to me because is he going to be able to make those checkdowns consistently uh, in in games? Uh, I think that's something that that evidence shows he's not done, uh, and so it's how bad will the sacks or, or can he throw it away? Can he avoid those big negative plays that could come because of that? Right. And I think that's I think that's smart to not assume you can change a guy and, and think that you can do something that multiple coaches have been in, unable to do. And I always go back to the Joe Gibbs line that I've heard used on this a few times, which is he said that guys would come to him and they say, well, you can change Joe. You can change him. You can change him. He's like, this guy's been like this for 20 some years. What makes you think I can change him in one? So, you know, so like you have to, I think the smart coaches understand what they can and can't do with a guy and you play accordingly. It's, you know, an umpire might have a bad strike zone, but if you know the strike zone, you can adapt and adjust. And um, you know what I mean? So I think that, I think that that's a smart way to go. With Jahan Dotson, again, I've heard he's looked good. What, what you talk about the hands, what kind of catches are you seeing? Is it more than just the hands that are, are, are standing out to you? Yeah, I think the the quickness and the speed is is also standing out to me. Uh, I talked to um, his trainer at Exos, a facility in Phoenix where he trained before uh, the draft, and and Nick Hill is the guy's name, and and he was telling me that he thinks Jahan's speed is different from a Denzel Ward. He's not a he's not as much a twitchy guy as he is a power guy. He was like he he has the same speed type as Debo Samuel. Obviously, he's like twenty pounds lighter than Debo. But he said he has a power base speed in his legs. Um, this is the guy that basically prepared Jahan to run the 40. Um, and and uh, he just has a, a different sort of look to him. And, and also the hands stood out to me. And it's the type of throws where it's, it's timing routes. It's back shoulders. It's outs. And to me, what stood out is because he and Carson aren't exactly on the same page. They aren't guys that have been doing it for five years together. It's almost like you see Carson either, you know, put it out a little bit more ahead of him than he'd like to and Jahan has to adjust or it's a little bit behind and so as they're refining their timing it's actually illustrating Jahan's hands Mm, that's a great point and you know the funny thing you say about the power based aspect to him because he's not a big guy you don't think power with him right absolutely and and another thing I will say about Jahan is um and, and you've seen this obviously in the press conferences is he's a very calm measured guy and and one instance I think that illustrates that is when I when I did go out to Phoenix um, a guy was showing me around the facility which is it's a beautiful facility and he saw Garrett Wilson the Ohio State receiver stretching across the field and he said oh that's Garrett Wilson he's probably gonna he's gonna be the number one receiver in the draft and there was a group of receivers standing like right next to us including Charleston Rambo from Miami including Jahan a couple other guys and Rambo, who's a more demonstrative guy, was like, ah, oh, man, like, don't say that near me. I don't want to hear that. And another guy waved it off and, you know, was, was obviously, you know, frustrated that the, the tour guy had said that. Jahan, I, I had to imagine he heard it. But, you know, if he didn't, he just kind of, you know, walked away. It, it was not, uh, you know, it was not something he even reacted to. And, and Nick Hill, uh, the trainer, was telling me that when this guy, you know, got up to the line for, for his, to run his practice 40, you know, the, the music there and everybody is super jazzed. It's a really big event. You know, they got to do it three times a week. Jahan was always at the, you know, always near the back, always very calm. And he'd get in there and he'd rip out, you know, whether it be a, a four, three, a four, four. Um, so, so I think that to me illustrates, you know, he has that power base speed and he's also very calm about it. And so I think that, uh, you know, obviously every rookie is going to have some adjustments coming to the NFL, but 
that sort of mindset, I think, is encouraging when you talk about a guy transitioning. He's also, to me, he's a mature route runner too. And you saw that a couple of times, like he, he knows how to, I've talked about this with others, but he knows how to sell a fake. And I think like, I still, you know, one of the things I love to do is record the receivers. And I watched, I go back home and I watch them again to see what separates a Terry McLaurin from this guy, from this guy, from this guy. And it's the ability to, one of the things is the ability to sell a route. And with Jahan has that. And you saw that in college. And I think that stuff really translates well to the NFL, which is why these guys thought he was one of the most pro ready targets um, coming into the NFL. So that's something I think that will, I'm curious to see how that helps him when we get to September. And it's funny you mentioned like the, his ability to sell a fake. I, I talked to Taylor Stubblefield. I don't know if you had him, you might've had him on here. Um, the receivers coach from yes. Penn state. Yeah. And, and he said that that is something that Jahan wanted to work on when he went back to school his senior year. And so obviously that's uh, you know, a very intentional approach by him. And it's funny because that's something that Terry McLaurin did too. After he got to the NFL, I mean, he worked, he started working on at Ohio state with Brian Hartline, great receivers coach. Um, but it was really too, when he got to the NFL and he went through spring workouts and he took the tips from some of the, from some of the corners, because you'd see him like, Oh, this guy looks like, you know, he's running this rally, like, but he's not getting open. And then in between OTAs and mini camp and then training camp, Terry worked on all that stuff and he came back to camp and was like a different receiver. So guys like that who take what they learn and apply, can go apply it and work on it are different. And I think that's one of the things that I think, you know, should get people at least very interested in Jahan Dotson. So let's a couple more things. I want to get to RFK. Chase Young was there today. Um, last year, I know that you were big on him being there for leadership and all that. I felt like this was, not a big deal, but a deal. What, what, what's your take? And then him coming here today, what did you think? Yeah, and, and I, I, I thought it was a big deal for his leadership if he then did not play well. Correct. Right. I mean, right. Chase, Chase told me, you know, year one, like, you can't, you can't be loud and not make no plays, I think was his right. exact quote. And so, you know, you saw that last year, you know, the consequences of doing that. And so uh, to me, it was important that, that he was here today. I think Ron Rivera, it was important to him as well. Um, Chase, we didn't see Chase on the field uh, too much. He came out of the building uh, with about 45 minutes left in practice. He was rehabbing with Al Bellamy, the head of the trainer. Um, he came out and he stood next to Jack Del Rio. Uh, he was listening to the calls. Uh, you can kind of see he was very intent on that. And he was also hyping up Montez Sweat. Uh, his close friend um, and, and kind of talking about, Hey, you know, your step was too long here. Your pad level was too high here. So that's really um, what chase was, was able to do today. And um, he, he sort of, uh, you know, didn't really engage on any, on any questions about why it was important for him to be at OTAs. Uh, Ron certainly talked about leadership and, and the ability to lead, not only when it's easy, but when it's hard. And he said, you know, today would have been an easy day for chase to lead. So, it's about consistency. Basically, you got to show up every day. You got to, it's got to be organic. You got to take that mantle when it's, when it's difficult. Um, not just at the end of your rookie year, when you, when you're, you know, playing really well and this team's fighting for a playoff spot, that, that last part was, was sort of my editorializing, not necessarily Ron specific. Quote, right. But, um, but I think he would agree with that. Right. Um, and so to me, uh, it, it was important for him to be here. And I think, you know, him being here through the rest of the program is at least going to help. Yeah, and I, and I would agree with that. And I think Montez being there too, and people kind of, he always kind of gets lost in the shuffle there, but I think it's right now because he's the one who's on the field. Chase is at least rehabbing, and I don't blame him for wanting to finish his rehab with the guy who he's been very comfortable with all along. I mean, anybody who's been through rehab knows you want, you want to stick with people who are you're comfortable with because you get a rhythm with them. So, but Montez being there was a big deal. Absolutely. And I will say Chase also um, provided some new insight into exactly what procedure he had done down in Pensacola with Dr. James Andrews, the, you know, obviously famed uh, right. sports surgeon. But basically he said that he had um, what is known as an ACL reconstruction, which is different from an ACL repair in a repair, which has a little bit shorter recovery time. You just reattach the ligament um, in the knee, basically, whereas in a reconstruction, which Chase had, they actually took a graft out of his patellar tendon, his kneecap in his left knee, and they put it in his right knee. Um, and so it's a little bit longer recovery time, but, but 
it's the it's the gold standard. That's the thing that uh, is supposed to be you know supposed to be better long term. Um, right. And so Logan Thomas actually uh, was saying last month that, that he and Chase had two different injuries. So they're actually, you know, even though Chase suffered his three weeks earlier, um, they're kind of on the same timeline now. Chase said the left knee is not bothering him at all. The one that they took the graft out of uh, is not bothering him at all. But um, an interesting, you know, kind of delineation yeah. and explanation for his surgery. Absolutely, because that that obviously affects because both those guys are bumping right up against the start of the season now. So they, it could be very interesting for both of them with, to, to watch. Them. I mean, you know, I mean, Logan, it's going to be really tough because it was December and the chase in that situation. I think it's going to be tough for him as well. But. We'll see. So let's get to your RFK story. And this is something that we get asked about a lot. Like, why not go to RFK? Because I think everybody would love that move. A lot of people would love that move. And I think the team would favor that move if they could, if it would work out. But all we've, you know, I think for people who have listened, you know that there are issues there because it's a government owned land, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you were part of a, um, a group, a couple of people, I think, I don't remember how many were on the story. Um, two or three, three. Wow. Okay. Look at that. Um, three on the story. I usually just do write my stories by myself, but if you know, it's not, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Actually, I had Tisha Thompson on there with me today. So I, I get help too. So, but it was a good story and it explains the RFK situation. So have at it, Sam. <laughs> Yeah, so the basics, everybody knows that the federal government owns it. Um, basically, I, I can do a chronological timeline here is uh, last year, the, the city's efforts to uh, obtain that land pick up. So Congresswoman uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton basically gets a working group together uh, that includes the mayor's office, uh, that includes the National Park Service, you know, through the Department of Interior um, and so, some other stakeholders and says, okay, you know, we're, we're in the House of Natural Resources Committee, which is like they have the jurisdiction uh, should a bill be introduced. Um, sorry to use so many governmental, you know, jargony words. Uh, but basically, you know, gets these people together uh, and the mayor's office and the team uh, start meeting and they basically come up with a plan. Uh, and as we get towards March, they want to put this in basically Congress's big spending package in, in in uh, March, as we get closer to that, um, the Congresswoman says, hey, I need this DC City Council and the mayor's office to be on the same page to, to have a, a unified plan of how to acquire and develop this land. And basically that meeting, you know, the, the, that briefing never happens. Um, the, you know, mayor's office, uh, they have two calls, one in early March, and then after the you know, the legislation passes without, uh, without, you know, that legislation, which would give DC the land passes, they, they have another meeting in early April saying, okay, what are we going to do now? And in early April, the Congresswoman's office says, hey, mayor's office, you guys need to brief the council, you guys need to get them up to speed. So the mayor's office sends the council a letter basically saying, here's what it is, you know, here's our plan, we're going to put it in a COVID relief bill. Um, you know, let us know if you guys want to know anything more. And, and, and the council does not respond and the mayor's office does not follow up. So literally it is legislation is sitting there uh, because of a disagreement between, you know, Mayor Muriel Bowser and council chairman Phil Mendelson. It, it's, it's sitting there and, and there's no meeting planned uh, as far as we know. Uh, so it's basically just sitting there uh, 190 acres uh, of, a, of a rusting stadium. And people are going to be slamming their heads hearing that because it's like that to me is, I think if, if this franchise wants to start to win a lot of people back, I think a big move would be going there as we have seen from the outrage. Listen, first of all, win, wherever you go, win. I mean, Kansas City is not, Kansas City Chief Stadium is not downtown Kansas City. You know, um, Denver does not play, well, actually Denver does, but like, you know, who Dallas does not play downtown Dallas. So they, if you win, they're going to show up. But I think there's so much goodwill that needs to be built here that one of those would be figuring that out. But that's not up to the team. That's a, that's what, you know, I, I wanted to kind of let people know that part of it. But do you think because the Virginia General Assembly, they're pushing that vote off. And we know that that, you know, the I think it's, tw I think it's a September 2026 is when the lease actually the agreement ends with PG County, right? So they can they can extend that. 
do you think that how long do you think they can keep pushing the stadium situation off that maybe by that time something could be worked out in D.C.? Or do you think that that's a lost cause in D.C.? I don't think Virginia is a lost cause. Uh, no, think- is D.C. a lost cause? Oh, oh, oh. I, I actually don't think so. And, and I think that some people may, you know, be skeptical of me when I say this, but I still think it could end up in any of the three jurisdictions. Obviously, like there's a big problem with D.C. because they don't even own the land they would want the team to be on. Um, and there's a big problem with Virginia in this flagging support and you don't even have the stadium authority created. Uh, and, and obviously there's an argument to be made for Maryland because Dan Center already owns 200 acres there and Maryland's going to put the $400 million into the area, whether the DC, you know, or whether the team comes or not. Um, but I still think it's, it's, it's pretty open because we don't have enough information yet to know like how strong each team's case is. Like, right. You know, if Virginia were to pass this and say, okay, we're going to give you $300 million, then we know, okay, this is what they're offering. Right. If DC were able to get the land and obviously there's a lot of hoops you got to jump through for that. Um, you know, I think obviously they they would become a, a, a premium spot that this team could end up at. Yeah. So I don't think we have enough information to say, hey, here's who's in first, second, and third. I think we've got to wait until at least Virginia is able to solidify their stadium authority. And if D.C. can ever get on the same page and introduce some legislation, um, then we could start talking about, okay, you know, this because I don't think the commanders want to, you know, they don't want to three is is the best number for them in terms of jurisdictions competing for them to get the best deal. I don't think they want to move forward unless all three, you know, really have their stuff together. So, so to me, it's sort of a moot point now to, to say, okay, that, you know, this is first, second, and third. I also wonder Sam too, in just two more minutes here, but I also wonder if you, they can get through this season, put a lot of this other stuff behind them, get it resolved one way or another. And if you can go out and then let's say, let's say you get this resolved. We got the hearings coming up later this month. Maybe this gets resolved. The NFL finishes their investigation, et cetera. Then you go out and you have a good season. Then maybe you win a playoff game. I mean, some of this people are like, okay, yeah, you know, I don't believe in the tooth fairy either, but, <laughs> but what if like, it's, I don't think it's far fetched with this team. So what if all that happens? I wonder if they would be in a better spot to get some of those, to get some of that goodwill back and to get more people more willing to do things to get them to move to their jurisdiction. Absolutely. I mean, if, if, if you can do that, uh, if you can put investigations and in, in all of the you know, negative publicity behind you and kick it down the road and have a good season, that would be the ideal setup. Um, I do think that it is, a, it is a big deal whether or not Virginia creates its stadium authority, how much they're willing to contribute to me is not important or not as important because if they play well, you could say, okay, you know, we're coming back We're you know, we've, we've turned, you know, we've turned the page, whether or not people believe that, like you right. can say, okay, you know, we're taking demonstrable steps and we want more money, but if you don't have that stadium authority in Virginia, you can't even negotiate, right. you know, in the same way that DC would need to get the land. So th- that I think is the biggest thing. Virginia has got to create the stadium authority. DC has to get the land. And then, you know, if you kick the can down the road and you say, okay, we're, we're revisiting this next year because we want to drum up the competition. We want to get better packages from each jurisdiction. Then you can do that. Um, and which is why to me, uh, you know, I, I just don't think we're at a place yet where we can evaluate the packages. Very good. And I even asked Chap Peterson last week um, about that. He was a state senator who came out strongly against it, but he was a former, he was a Redskins fan back in the day. But I even asked him, said, you know, he said that he doesn't see the support. I said, what if they get through this season and kind of gave him that scenario? He goes, well, I'd revisit my vote, too. So we'll see. But, Sam, do me a favor. Tell people where they can find you and where they can read you. Uh, You can find me uh, on Twitter at Sam, the number four TR, S-A-M, the number four TR. You can always find my work in the Washington Post. And and you can find my best bits uh, here at the end of this podcast because we always do something. Well, I've got nothing. I told you I've got, I am zapped. So I'm going to, you got, you got the floor, man. If you got anything for me, that's fine. You're going to win. I've got nothing. It's been a long It sounds like you're getting yourself right now. So I don't need to, I don't need to kick a dog while you're down. (laughs) Very good. Sam, thanks a lot. I look forward to seeing you next week. Awesome. Thanks. It's always kind. Everybody, it's John Kine. Do me a favor and hit that subscribe button and I'll continue to bring you guests who provide excellent insight 
into the Washington Commanders. And while you're here, check out the other terrific content on the Empire Media Network, including Inside the Cap with Joel Corey and All's Caps with Steve Wino and former Washington Capitol Carl Alsner. Go ahead, hit that subscribe button. Thank you.